So um, we're looking forward to starting a new discussion topic today. Uh, we're going to focus on how the food production system, really, from, um, from farm to fork, is innovating to find new ways to address all of the issues in the food system and, and try to develop a better system for tomorrow. So I think yesterday we heard a lot about the issues and the opportunities, and I'm looking forward to really diving in and exploring some of the solutions that are um, being implemented now and, and also some that are on the horizon. So let's get started. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Frank Mitlerner is a professor of air quality, uh, a specialist in the cooperative extension in the Department of Animal Science at the University of California, Davis. He brings expertise in mitigating air emissions from livestock operations and has been recognized internationally and nationally for his work in the subject. Frank, thanks for being here. If you could come on up. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I come to you from uh, the ground zero of environmental discussions. Um, and that's the sunny state of California. Uh, it's the leading agricultural state in the nation, uh, producing 50% of all fruits and vegetables, 20% of all dairy. Um, what many people don't know is that about half of the state uh, is marginal land land that cannot be used to produce crops or, you know, it's really not usable for most, most other purposes. Um, it's largely used for the use of livestock, grazing livestock. We also have 20% of the U.S. dairy population in this valley, in this grand, great central valley here. So this is the, the place where most of, of agriculture occurs in, uh, in California. And this is also a place where we have significant environmental issues. What you see there, this haze, is not haze, it's smog. And indeed, this area here, uh, Fresno, California, is not just the nation's leading agricultural county, it's also the one with the worst air quality in the United States. So California has very aggressive um, regulations uh, attempting to reduce environmental impacts of all sectors. And uh, our Air Resources Board is probably one of the most uh, proactive and aggressive agencies uh, trying to curb the impact of all sectors of society on the environment, including livestock. The livestock sector in California with respect to greenhouse gases um, is uh, contributing to 5.4%. So dairy and beef contribute to 5.4% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Uh, for comparison, the transportation sector contributes to 36.9%. So that's just a little entry. Um, now, there's a lot of uh, conflicting, seemingly conflicting information that you will hear uh, throughout this workshop. Um, some people say that livestock is the predominant contributor of greenhouse gases in the world, producing even more greenhouse gases than the transportation sector. Uh, the number that is often circulated is 18% of all greenhouse gases globally stemming from livestock. You oftentimes hear that livestock occupies 70% of all agricultural land globally. And uh, you oftentimes also hear that grazing systems produce less greenhouse gases, are better for the environment than conventional systems. Uh, throughout my talk, I will address several of these, uh, of these issues. The first two here, uh, namely the 18% number and also the comparison of livestock to transportation, uh, stem from this publication titled Livestock's Long Shadow from 2006, published by the FAO in Rome. And they said in their executive summary that the livestock sector is a major player responsible for 18% of total greenhouse gas emissions, globally that is, and that livestock uh, produces a higher share of greenhouse gas than transportation. Since this report came out, uh, which I critiqued back then. Um, since that report came out, the 18% number was uh, changed to 14.5%, the majority of that number being related to land use changes, largely deforestation in the developing part of the world, so third world countries and emerging countries. Um, the issue of comparing livestock to transportation was refuted by me, and the reason for that was that the FAO used two different methodologies when comparing the impact of livestock, particularly on greenhouse gases, versus the impact of transportation on greenhouse gases. While they used a life cycle assessment, 
looking at all aspects of livestock production from cradle to grave for livestock. They used direct emission assessment for transportation, not life cycle emissions, but tailpipe emissions, leaving out the production of cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, the steel, the rubber, the plastic going into that, the construction of roads, airports, harbors, and so on. That was an apples to oranges comparison, which I hear all the time. Whenever I hear people uh, making comparisons of livestock to transportation, uh, I'm very much aware that people cherry pick um, and use direct emissions for the one and life cycle emissions for the other. Life cycle emissions really stem from the belief that you ought to uh, look at cradle to grave contributions of a service or product. For example, the carbon foot footprint of a gallon of milk does not just include direct emissions of the cow, enteric emission, the belching, or emissions from manure, but also um, soil emissions, herbicide, pesticide use uh, needed to produce crops, the crops themselves. Um, uh, then eventually uh, the feed that's produced from these crops, the animals themselves, their manure and so on. And it keeps going, going, going until it eventually, that product eventually reaches our mouth. That's the grave. And that's the life cycle assessment I'm talking about. And I choose to use life cycle assessment for my work. Um, I have been uh, chairing this a committee, FAO committee, after critiquing Livestock's Long Shadow early on, I later became the chairman of this um, FAO committee called LEAP. And uh, this committee has released guidelines on how to conduct LCAs for all the different livestock and feed commodities. It is generally considered a gold standard for global LCAs these days. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, working with about 300 of uh, the world leading experts on life cycle assessments in assembly of these uh, standards. When uh, looking at greenhouse gases in the United States, uh, we often turn to the EPA, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, for clarity on which sectors contribute to what amount. These are direct emissions of different sectors of society and from the emission inventory of the EPA. And what you see on top here is which greenhouse gases are main contributors to our greenhouse gas inventory and carbon dioxide sticks out, a direct result mainly of fossil fuel use. And if you look at um, different sectors of society, you find that the EPA assigns 30% of all greenhouse gases to power production and use, 26% to transportation. The list goes on, uh, all of agriculture combined, that's not just animal agriculture, even though a cow is depicted here, all of agriculture combined contributes to 9%, and approximately 4% to livestock, and that's dairy, beef, sheep, pigs, poultry, about 4% in the United States today. As I told you, in California, it's slightly higher. It's 5.4% of our total. But the notion that livestock rivals transportation as a greenhouse gas emitter is false. And oftentimes, a global number like the 18% is applied to the United States to uh, convince people to change their eating habits. And I think this is a conflating of information from global to national to regional, which I think doesn't hold true. And it leads us onto a wrong path for solutions, suggesting that the use of fossil fuel is really not as big a deal as your diet. And that, I think, particularly in a country like ours, is false. This year is what I think is arguably the largest contributor to um, greenhouse gases and environmental harm overall across all impact categories. It is the amount of food waste produced in the United States. This is from the National Geographic. It depicts an average US family in front of the food waste generated over the course of a year. Now, this is not just the food waste occurring at the household level, but throughout the entire uh, food supply chain from cradle to grave. 40% of food produced in this country goes to waste. Globally, that number seems to be closer to 30%. But either way, it's unacceptably high and arguably one of the main contributors of our food supply uh, to environmental harm. This slide here, I think, is a very important one. And uh, in the interest of time, I cannot go into detail. But on the x-axis, you see the years 1750 to 2050. Hence, it's considered as the 2050 challenge, depicting the human population increase uh, through our lifetimes. I'm in my late 40s. When I was a, when I was a boy, we were here at three, three and a half billion people. Today, we are at 
And by the time I'm an old man, we'll be at nine and a half billion people. Or, ladies and gentlemen, throughout my lifetime, throughout yours, human population on this planet will have tripled. But the natural resources to feed these people will not have tripled. If we are lucky, we'll have the same amount of natural resources, but most likely fewer. This population increase is not so much happening in the developed world, here in brown, but in emerging and developing countries. Um, and it's not just a fact of people having more babies or so, but also, and particularly, a higher life expectancy, an increasing life expectancy. Cumulatively, that, means to more, uh, that leads to more people in the world. One of my favorite slides here, it shows a satellite image of the world, and this circle here contains more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside the circle than outside the circle. Clearly a major food security area. But not the only one. Southeast Asia will increase human population by 41%. Africa will increase by 50%. South America by 7 North America by 4 and Europe will slightly shrink. We have work cut out for us with respect to finding means to feeding a, global, a, a growing global population without depleting all natural resources. The demand for X meat milk is increasing sharply, particularly in developing parts of the world. This is largely a function of disposable income that you see on the x-axis here. On the y-axis, you see meat consumption. And as you can see, the higher the income, the greater meat consumption. Uh, in the US, we are the highest. European countries follow. Currently, China is still all the way to the left. But make no mistakes, in 10 years, China will be at least where the US is today, at least where the US is today. Some slides here that I find important. This first one is a global map showing where in the world we have the greatest concentration of livestock. And you might think of us as having a lot of livestock here, but we pale compared to countries like India or China. More important than this slide is the next, which shows where in the world we have cropland. Cropland to grow food for human consumption. Whether we have 3, 7, 9, or 12 billion people in the world, that's the only cropland we have available. I want to depict this problem in a different way. Imagine this sheet of paper here, normal sheet of paper, as the surface of the Earth. If I now fold this piece of paper twice, then this here is the total amount of land in the world. The rest is water and ice. Of this total amount of land in the world, the equivalent of my business card is the total amount of agricultural land. The rest is forests and deserts and cities and so on. So my business card is the total amount of agricultural land in the world. If I now go ahead and fold my business card into one piece that's two-thirds and the other piece that's one-third, then I rip my own business card into pieces, then the larger piece here depicts the amount of agricultural land in the world That's called marginal. Marginal because we cannot grow crops on that land. Either because the soil is not fertile or there's not enough moisture. The only land use for two-thirds of all agricultural land in the world is through ruminant livestock. And that's beef, dairy, goats, sheep. You cannot grow crops on the vast majority of that land. The remaining one-third of my business card is the so-called arable land. And here you can grow whatever pretty much you want. Of course, there are regional uh, determinants as to what you can grow, but that's arable land. By the way, half of this arable land in the world is fertilized with chemical fertilizers, and the other half is fertilized with organic fertilizers. And organic fertilizers, by and large, are animal manure. I just want to emphasize that to show you the importance of the livestock sector with respect to global food supply. Two-thirds of the world's agricultural land currently is used by livestock, particularly ruminant livestock, because there's no other food-producing way to deal with this. This slide is a very important one. It shows on the x-axis the amount of milk produced per cow per year. And on the y-axis, it shows the carbon footprint of dairy production. What this slide basically shows is that a cow that produces very little milk has a very high carbon footprint. Why? Because the amount of nutrients you feed to that cow is largely used to just keep her alive, body temperature even, and so on. It's called um, maintenance requirements. Okay? She produces very little milk. 
A cow here on this side produces a lot of milk, and therefore her carbon footprint is diluted uh, through the amount of milk she produces. In the United States, just to give you a number, we produce about 25,000 pounds of milk per cow per year, 25,000. In India, we produce about 20 times less than that. India, African countries, and so on are over here. The US is off the scale here someplace. In Mexico, it takes about five times the number of cows to produce the same amount of milk as one cow here in the United States. If you now think of the cumulative environmental impact of one versus five, or 25 cows, that's US, Mexico, and India, then there are vast differences with respect to environmental footprint. It extends beyond carbon footprint. Water usage and so on is grossly different. This is a slide uh, that came from the FAO. It compares uh, the carbon footprint of different regions in the world with respect to dairy production. And here you can see that North America is not the highest, and that's what many people think but it's the lowest of any region in the world with respect to greenhouse gas emissions per unit of milk produced. And this is North America. If the US were separated from Mexico, our column would be half of what it is on this slide. The next one also from the FAO shows how ruminant meat, that's basically beef, dairy, and non-ruminant meat differ regionally throughout the world. The US in blue, then the European Union, Brazil, and so on. You can see here that we by far have the lowest, not the highest, the lowest carbon footprint uh, from throughout the world uh, with respect to beef, dairy, and non-ruminant meat. That's largely a function of the following four aspects. Reproductive efficiency, improved health, and that means vaccination and treatment of animals, an improved genetics sector, meaning providing high merit genetics uh, on the animal side and the plant side, and the feeding of more energy-dense diets. These four tools have allowed us, and now comes something very important. These four tools have allowed us to shrink animal herds to historic levels in this country. And I will show you what I mean on my next slides. The first one is a dairy example. In 1950, we used to have 25 million dairy cows in this country. Today, we have 9 million dairy cows. So our dairy herd has shrunk drastically. Even though we have so much fewer cows, we are producing 60% more milk with this much smaller herd. 60% more milk with this much smaller herd. That means the carbon footprint today is two thirds smaller than it used to be 70 years ago. The same is true for beef. We used to have 140 million head of beef in the United States in 1970. Today we have 90 million, so 50 million fewer, but we produce the same amount of beef today than we did in 1970. The same is true for pork production. We have tripled pork production in the United States over the last 60 years. This is a vast improvement in performance. Just to give you an example, uh, a, a little analogy, or not, not an analogy, but um, uh, an example of where we have come. So I told you we have 9 million dairy cows today. Have you ever thought about how many horses we have in this country? 9.5 million horses. We have more horses in this country than dairy cows. Of course, nobody will ever talk about horses and their environmental footprint. And nobody will ever talk about 140 million dogs and cats, consuming the equivalent amount of food as 70 million people, 70, 70 million people. I don't mean to deflect from livestock's contribution. I know they are significant, but I just want to put things into perspective. I want to give you an example from China. I spend about two months a year in China. I have an appointment at a Chinese university. And so uh, I, I am always amazed when I see livestock production in China, and not in a positive way, I might say. Half of the world's pigs live in China. By the way, they live in the same regions as people do, namely in the coastal regions. They produce a staggering one billion pigs per year in China. But what I find more amazing than that number of one billion pigs is the fact that they have a pre-weaning mortality of 400 million pigs. That means 400 million pigs die before they ever make it to market. They go to a landfill. Why? Because the veterinary system doesn't really function, the genetics is poor, the nutrition is insufficient, 
400 million pigs die before going to market. That's a crop larger than the entire pig crop in the United States. And that's China. It's way worse in countries such as India or in African countries. The IPCC believes that about 70 to 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of the global livestock impact occurs in developing countries. And the reason for that are these inefficiencies I'm talking about. The reason why India's livestock has such an important environmental impact, such a great environmental impact, is because they have hundreds of millions of bovines to supply the products people demand. In summary, livestock, as I just said, um, has very different environmental footprints throughout the world. And we must understand that, by and large, technologies have allowed us to get to where we are today in countries like ours. There are reductions possible of, for example, greenhouse gases. In California, where I live, the state has now mandated a 40% reduction, 4-0, of greenhouse gases to be achieved in the next 12 years. It will be achieved. There are new technologies to reduce greenhouse gases, for example, in the rumen of these animals, where the majority of methane stems from. There are also ways to take manure and put it into anaerobic digesters and produce power or fuels. But my take home message to you today is that production intensity and emission intensity are inversely related. The more efficient you are in agricultural production, the relative smaller becomes your environmental footprint. It's the same as with your vehicles. The more fuel efficient your vehicle is, the less gas it burns and the fewer emissions you become. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to entertain any questions that might come later. Thank you.